Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thanks for joining EBIPSA special edition webinar. I'm glad that Professor Preeti DeWield has agreed to offer this webinar to us. Uh, professor Peter DeWild is a professor in building performance analysis at University of Plymouth, and he will be talking about one of his favorite project, uh, which is about to finish, or rather has finished, is a book on building performance analysis. I know uh, amount of hard work which he has put in. I'm sort of partially aware about uh, how much has gone into it. Uh, I'm very glad that it is ready now, and uh, Ibipsa has endorsed this, doc, uh, this this book. It's very important for us, and I'm sure that this book is going to serve as a textbook to many, many schools and many, many colleges, and even for, for the people in the practice who are interested in uh, building performance analysis. I'll not take much time. Uh, before I hand it over to Peter, I request uh, all of you to send any question, if at all, you have by using a question pane. I'll be collecting all the questions and at the end of the webinar, I will curate and we'll ask a few of relevant questions to Peter, depending upon how much time available to us and to Professor. Uh, with this, I'll hand it over to Peter. Peter, over to you. Thanks for, thanks for offering the webinar. Thank you, Rajan, for the introduction. And I'd like to start with welcoming the audience. Thanks for joining the webinar today. So as introduced, I will be talking today about the book on building performance analysis, which I've been writing over the last four years. And to kick off, I'll just dump a few facts on that book on the screen. So it's a piece of work that consists of 11 chapters, more than 200,000 words on 600 pages. It has quite a few references. I counted more than 1,600 in there. Like already said by Rajan in the introduction, it is the second book that is endorsed by IBIPSA. It's got a foreword by Fried Augenbrew, my former mentor at Georgia Tech. It's published by Wiley Blackwell, and it should be uh, available as a digital copy as we speak. And the paper version will be available early July. So today in the webinar, I will want to start with giving a, a brief overview of the book, a little bit of the background and the general structure of the thing. Then I will hone in on two specific topics. I will talk a little bit about building performance and I will talk about analysis. Then at the back of that, I will talk about emergent theory, which I think is one of the important contributions that the book makes to the building simulation community. Uh, I'll wrap up then with some conclusions and then hand over to Rajan to uh, organize the question and answering at the back of this webinar. So first of all, why this book? Um, I was appointed professor in building performance analysis in 2013, that's five years ago. And when I started in that role, I knew quite a bit about building performance analysis, but I also knew that there was a void in the theory on the subject. So I thought that was a good point to start actually with doing some research and getting deeper material together on this topic. And I asked myself the four following questions, which you see on the screen. I wanted to know what building performance really is. If you talk about it, you need to know. Um, then in our drive to the building simulations, you ask yourself, how can we measure it? How can we analyze it? Then a third question is, if we quantify building performance, how can we actually use that to good? How can we make use of that to design and construct and operate buildings and make a better world? And the final question is, there's a lot of other domains that talk about performance and I wanted to look across the boundaries and see what I could find in those other fields and what would be useful in our own area. The relation with IBIPSA then, and this is actually a slide which you might recognize from my presentation at Building Simulation uh, last year in San Francisco. Um, IBIPSA has a mission, and if you go on the website, you will find that, and it will say that IBIPSA is founded to advance and promote the science of building performance simulation in order to improve the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of new and existing buildings worldwide. That is a nice thing. 
And if you look at that, there's two key ingredients. There's simulation and there's building performance. And if I go into the library or online and search for standard texts, then there's quite a bit on simulation. And uh, there's two books covers on the screen. There is the famous book by Zeigler and his colleagues on theory of modeling and simulation. And there's another book there on mathematical modeling of physical systems. And a lot of papers on that subject, but building performance kind of seems to be the thing that we evade. So we talk about it, but we don't have a, a real handle on it. So my work is trying to, to address that issue. Um, if you're involved in IBIPSA, you might also know that IBIPSA already endorsed an earlier book, that is the orange book, which you see on the screen. And you might ask yourself, what is the relation with this new book and the old book that is already around? Um, the old book, if you look at the list of chapter titles on this screen, there's a whole, whole list of them. And I think the existing orange book really helps us to explain to students and people in the field how you do simulation the details of carrying it out. And it looks at the range of systems that you can simulate, uh, HVXC and that type of thing. But in that context, there is relatively little on building performance as a subject in itself. The one chapter where it really emerges is the chapter that is written by Gottfried Augenbrou, my mentor, uh, which is the second chapter which talks about the role of simulation in performance-based building. And you could say that my new book is actually taking that chapter that exists in the orange book and now puts that into a book in its own right uh, as a separate, separate thing. So writing a book like this, I already said it cost me four years to write it. And I joke uh, with my colleagues that it's four years of writing time, but 10 years of my life. But the question of course is what material goes into a, a piece of work like that? First of all, I've done a pretty extensive literature review, really gone back to the basics there. Um, the book is also driven by my own research track record, and I'll say a few words about that later. Work from my students, but also input and feedback from friends and colleagues. And there's a couple of uh, faces on this screen, Fried Albenbrew, of course, who kind of set me on this course, and then Chul Su Park, Georg Sutar, Wei Tian, and Ruchi Shadhari. Uh, have been instrumental in me writing this book, providing feedback and helping me to create a product that is uh, now being published. So a few words about the underlying research efforts. Um, I have my own long track record, but there's a couple of things that I want to flag up here. So first of all, I did quite a bit of work on building simulation. For instance, I looked at the impact of climate change, different scenarios on buildings. So simulation was a starting point. Then along my research line, at some point I started looking into the energy performance gap, the comparison between what we predict at the design stage and what we measure once a building is in operation. Um, one of my well-cited papers is on that subject. And it kind of expanded the view. I've also looked at completely instrumentational research. So a project on transient thermography was just about how you use that technology and how you can actually capture a series of time frames. So that takes me out of the simulation domain. And then the final project that is mentioned is a project on energy visualization, where actually we looked at how you can impact the behavior of people. And for that project, I worked together with people in psychology, again, looking across an other field and getting interested in the position of building performance analysis in the wider context of what other fields are doing. So I mentioned that the book is based on an extensive literature review and my very conservative estimate is that we probably talk about 60,000 or more publications that are available in the literature on some aspects of building performance. And you see a couple of journals here on the screen. Uh, the IBIPSA Journal of Building Performance Simulation, of course, is a good source, but there's a whole range of others, applied energy, energy in buildings, building an environment, all the way to more specific um, and more subject-oriented things like the Fire Safety Journal or a journal on construction and building materials. 
all those journals contain a whole range of articles that all take a piece of the performance analysis slice and make a small contribution to that field. But what it was missing is an overview that takes this together and tries to integrate them. Now, I've been looking at a lot of that literature, um, of course, not reading all of it, but making my selection and being guided by uh, keywords that I was looking for. But in that work, I also discovered that we're at risk of forgetting some of the seminal work that's been done in the past. And I always like to flag up two uh, publications that I came across uh, and that kind of surprised me. The first of his uh, work by Marcus and his colleagues at uh, a research entity that was called the Building Performance uh, Research Unit at Strathclyde University. And they already published a book on building performance back in 1972, when I was one year old. So there is a track record that we really need to take a look at and make sure that we build on that. And like they say, stand on the shoulders of giants to make a contribution. The second contribution that I always like to flag up is the work by the CIB Commission uh, 760, sorry, W60. And they wrote a report uh, which is famous as Report 64. Uh, strange to have a different number than the commission number. But that is really a very deep contribution on building performance done in the early 80s, still written on a typewriter with hand drawn figures in there. But one, I think, that is really worth flagging up to our students and ourselves and making sure that we build on what is done in that field. So that is the starting point. And then we move into my own contribution. What you see here is some images in the run-up. So the flyer that was distributed at Building Simulation 2017 in San Francisco last year, uh, a screenshot of the folders that were submitted to Wiley when the book went into uh, the first round of revisions and a slice from the ResearchGate uh, page where I announced this work last year. Um, so what is in this book and what can you expect there? Let's start by talking about who I wrote it for. So uh, I'm an academic, so obviously I write for the building science community. And just like Abipsa, that is industry and education. I would think that the work is really good for students, especially those that have a bit of uh, experience building science and systems already. So that's why I say senior, undergraduate and graduate students. Scholars and academics uh, hopefully will use this in moving forward the domain. But I've also done my best to make sure that it's interesting for consultants and practitioners. And I specifically think about the people that develop simulation tools, but also uh, physical instruments to analyze building performance. So the book itself, uh, it has three main parts. It has a part one foundation, a part two assessment, and a part three on impact. And of course, there's an introduction before that and then an epilogue in the back. If we talk about what is in those parts, then the introduction explains why this work and what the overlying structure of the book is. So in a way, that's a summary of this uh, part of the presentation. Then foundation really talks about the context in where, which we encounter building performance analysis, talks about the life cycle, about the stakeholders, about the challenges to buildings that we find. And it talks about the requirements that we can pose to buildings during a design stage or later, and how we can capture those and formulate them. Assessment then goes into the practicality of doing analysis. It talks about the criteria that we set for assessing buildings and buildings performance. It talks in depth about the various tools that we have, and it goes beyond simulation. It also has other things in there, and I'll talk about that later on in the webinar. And then it talks about the hard work that is required to actually do an analysis and it takes it into customizing tools and making sure that they are suitable to look at the specific context. Part three on impact then goes back to the building life cycle, the design of buildings and the operation of buildings and finally the state of the art of buildings which I capture in a chapter on high performance buildings. Beyond that I then take uh, points from 
the whole material that goes before and use that to uh, propose an emergent theory on building performance analysis to the audience in the wider field. The actual table of content, well, probably you should look at the book and look at the detail of the paragraphs, but these are the 11 chapters that are in there. And just to highlight, there's quite a bit in there on building needs and building functions, requirements and how you capture them. Um, then a lot on performance quantification and actually working with that quantification and what you can do throughout the life cycle. There's 11 chapters and of course in the webinar I'm not going to talk to each of them, but this is the overall structure that uh, underlies each of the chapters of the book. So I start with an introduction and no surprise then follows the main chapter content. At the end of each chapter, there is a case study and there's a whole range of things. So you see the uh, Bank of America in Atlanta on there. I've tried to get case studies from all over the world. So there's some from Europe, some from the US, some from Asia, even one from Antarctica. And those case studies help to show what we can do in terms of the content of the chapter, but it also shows some of the remaining challenges. And there's quite a few of that. The more you look at this topic of building performance analysis, the more you also realize that there's still quite a bit of work to be done. Each chapter also has a section on reflections where I bring in my own opinion and try to have that in a separate entry. A summary, which of course is useful if you use this as a textbook and you want to learn things. Then there's activities, and I've spent quite some time to making sure that I develop tasks that you can do with students, also uh, with your colleagues, to kind of reflect on the content of each chapter. That is mainly open assignments, so there's no good or wrong answer to that. It's just something to evolve and develop your thinking about the thing. And then at the back end of each chapter, there's a list of key references. I already mentioned that the whole book has more than 1600, so that is way too many. So what every chapter does is provide almost a reading list, recommendations of what you should look if you want to go deeper on that specific subject of that chapter. So that was the generic introduction to the book and the overview. So from here, I want to hone in on two things. I want to hone in on building performance and on the analysis. And like I already mentioned, building performance is a term that we use a lot, but which we seldom define. And I think that is that's one of the problems we face in our domain. We're not alone in that. Other fields like electronics and human resources, manufacturing, the medical sector, performing arts, social science, sports, tourism, transport and logistics all do the same. But I think it's a bit of a problem because it means we talk about how we analyze, but we don't talk about what it is we analyze. Of course, the first place you would start to look for definition of performance is the dictionary. And if you take that up, then what you find is basically two main definitions. You find performance as being the action or process of performing a task or function, but you also find one that has to deal with the arts and humanities and where performance has to do with the act of presenting a play or a concert or some other form of entertainment. So that is performance. That is already two ways of in interpreting that. But then there's also building. And if we talk about buildings, you can see buildings as an object, as a system. The definition in the dictionary talks about a structure with walls and roofs. There's also building performance as a process that is the, actually the activity of constructing a building. And then again, we have this view of architecture and aesthetics coming along. Now, if you think deeper about it, then you can also ask yourself, what is it that building performance does if we talk about a building as a system trying to perform a task or function? And if you look deeply at that, then performance is really something that lives on the interface between, at the one hand, somebody who needs a building, and on the other hand, what an actual building provides. So I call the person that needs a building, you can call that a client or a stakeholder. And that person had needs, 
they need to live somewhere, they need office space to go around their business, maybe sell something, or for uh, a hospital, you need to have space to conduct operations. That is all on the client side, and originally that will be phrased in the terms of stakeholder needs, and if we make it technical, then we get technical requirements. On the other side is the building, and all the parts and components that make up the building, and that has some sort of behavior that has attributes, and this building performance concept really lives on the interface between what the client needs and what the building provides. And our analysis effort is to try to see whether these two things match and to run tests to see how well that happens. Taking that even further, we can talk about what it is that the building needs to do, and we actually phrase that as functional requirements, but that is not yet performance because performance also has to do with how well that must be done. So the functional requirement tells us about what it is we expect of the building, and then performance is the concept that says how good, how well it must be done. There's a book by a consultant uh, named Thomas Gilb, uh, which was published in 2005, which I've been studying in detail, that talks quite a bit about these things, and he discerns three sub aspects of performance so you can dig even deeper if you wanted to and he talks about quality attributes resource saving attributes and workload capacity attributes so if you translate that to building for instance the quality could be how durable is a building how good is it in resisting something like earthquakes or bad weather resource saving might have to do with how much energy is needed or water is consumed and workload capacity would deal with performance in terms of, for instance, how many passengers can you handle in an airport facility. You can bring all of this then together in one overarching frame or definition. And what you see here is I go back to the view of engineering, the object, the process, and the architectural side of aesthetics. We can have definitions for performance in each of those domains and then a range of attributes that we can look at. And the list I gave you on the, the previous slide can actually be made a bit longer by looking at other literature. You can talk about responsiveness, timeliness of a building, and readiness of a building. In the construction side of things, we can look at the iron triangle of cost, time, and quality. Or you can, again, make that list longer by looking also at things like safety, waste reduction, and customer satisfaction. And then there's the difficult subject of performance in aesthetic terms, and that is the one where there's a lot of debate going on, but there's a range of terms there like creativity, interpretation, communication, embodiment, enchantment, and movement that we, again, could be looking at and try to operate with. So if I then look at what we teach our students here at Plymouth and what I see that others also do across the world, then typically we simplify things. We talk a lot about economy, money is what makes the world move, quality of life, thermal comfort, indoor air conditions, and we talk a lot about environment and things like climate change. If you then go to the IBIPSA conferences, you will see that reflected in the topics of the papers that you have there. Uh, my rough estimate is that around 70% will be about thermal aspects or energy, maybe 15% on lighting, 10% on airflow, and 5% on other things like acoustics. And I think that's actually a kind of strange picture if you think what it is that the building needs to do. This is my view of real life, and there's a whole long list in the book, an appendix that gives around 80 aspects that you could be looking at. And there's others in there, right? So there's resistance against burglary or making sure that vermin does not enter the building or how you deal with fire spread. Each of the terms you see on the screen is just a performance aspect and you could then go on to define a function. So for instance, if you talk about vermin, you want to prevent vermin from entering the building, that would be the function. And then you could have a performance aspect that actually tell you how well that needs to happen. So you might say, well, you need to keep out 80% of the insects or 95%, whatever you want to define there. That is the actual performance.
But the key thing to take away from this slide is that there's a long, long list of other aspects that we should be looking at. So that is point one, building performance. But then we move into building performance analysis. And I already in the introduction said that IBIPSA is concerned with building simulation, but there's other approaches. And from looking at it, I discern four main ways of analyzing performance. The first one is the obvious one uh, in most of the science, which is actually physical measurement in real situations. Then we have the computer simulation that we do within uh, this audience. And then there's two other methods. There's expert judgment and there's stakeholder evaluation. And I think we should look at those as well. Physical measurement, that is the classical way with direct observation. You think about Newton sitting under the apple tree and reaching conclusions when he sees the apple fall. That's what we also can do in buildings. And if you start being concerned with that and looking at what you can do, then there's a whole wide range of instruments that we can use and processes we can apply. Um, again, too many to handle, but the book has a, an appendix that lists some of the instruments that are available. You can do measurements over time, which is what we call monitoring. And you can also look at where you do this physical measurement. There's two things here. You can take parts of a building, part of a facade or part of a heating system and bring that into a lab where you have fully controlled conditions. Or you might actually want to do your uh, measurement on a real full size building. That typically is complex because there's factors in there like the climate, like the weather, like what occupants do in the building, which are hard to control. So that results in, by default, a semi-controlled experiment only, where you need to measure what the exciting factor is. One of the things that is in the book and where I've spent quite some time is actually providing an overview of different approaches to do physical measurements. So you will find sections on things like climate chamber measurement, co-heating tests, uh, experiments to see how the evacuation of a building works, blower door tests, hotbox measurements, thermography, uh, wind tunnels, each of them with references to the literature and a brief description of what you can do and what is relevant there. For the longer list, again, you will need to buy the book, but I'd like to point out that beyond that list of approaches to do physical measurements, I also have a quite comprehensive overview of some of the standards and norms by the ISO, ASTM, and SEN that apply to using that equipment. Then we move to computer simulation, and here I'm talking to an audience that knows all about that, but this is where we use the computer to predict the behavior of a building that is based on scientific computing. So we have underlying mathematical models and physics that we need to uh, understand and handle. But the good thing there is that we have full control of the experiment. We can change and repeat as we want to. Uh, we can also deal with buildings that do not exist yet. So during the design, there is no building, so you cannot do uh, physical experimentation, but simulation is available. And we can deal with large amount of variables so a calculation of up to 10 parameters you might still do on your handheld calculator or in an Excel spreadsheet. But if you end up with 10,000, then simulation is the way to go. Again, the book gives an overview of some of the approaches in here. And I try to give uh, a comprehensive view. So I deal with things like acoustics, CFD, fire simulation, heat and moisture models, or sometimes known as heat air moisture models, lighting, pedestrian movement simulation, the whole building thermal, of course, is involved. Um, and I also have small sections on general engineering, where we use the more generic tools that we can also apply to look at things, corporate simulation, and there's a section on Modelica there as well. And again, for the full list, I refer to the full book. Then there's this fourth category. And it's actually surprising to find that there's relatively little uh, literature on the subject, but that is using experts to have a view on buildings and give their opinion. Typically what you do there is bring in senior academics or consultants uh, that have been in the field for a long time. And if you use a good process, which is transparent, where the experts do not have uh, 
a vested interest in what is being uh, analyzed and a solid approach for getting the information from them, then it is a very good way of assessing performance. An example where you see that is in law, in legislation, if buildings fail, if there are problems, uh, collapses or fires, then typically what will happen is that an expert witness will be brought in to look at how well that building was designed and whether anybody is to blame for what happened later on. So this is really a valid methodology that we also need to bring in into our uh, toolbox. The final approach then that we have available is stakeholder evaluation. And the idea here is that we build for people. So the people that actually use the buildings or occupy them or own them, that should be the final person that is giving an assessment of how that building pans out once it's in operation. Um, I like to use the word stakeholder here. Um, occupant implies that you're in there, but there's always some people that have an, an interest in buildings and a, and a reason to do so, like for instance, an insurance company who will never be in that building. So I think we should have a, a wider view in there. But if we use this approach, we also need to be aware that stakeholder evaluation is always subjective. It's a proxy for real performance. For instance, if I ask my students what they think about the university building we're in, if you do that in, uh, in the fall semester when I just come back from holiday, they might have a completely different perception of that uh, from the point they're at, at the right at this moment when they're doing their exams and they're really stressed and they might actually blame part of that stress on the building. So we need to be very careful with the noise factors there. The book had a side uh, comment on POE, post occupancy evaluation, that is sometimes used as a synonym for stakeholder evaluation. But I think it's a bit of a dangerous term because it relates to a point in the life cycle. Uh, occupancy is really the handover from the construction to the client. And there's different approaches we could use past that moment. So that is why I prefer to do stakeholder evaluation rather than POE. Some of the things you have in here is the straight occupant survey where you have opinions of people. You could have an audit, you could have an expert walkthrough, focus group discussions, and you could combine it with monitoring or even simulation or expert witnesses. So different ways of doing things. Now that shows that we have a complex concept, building performance, and we have four ways of trying to quantify building performance. But real life is even more messy because if you look at real buildings, then what I find is that the criteria we have for these buildings are highly context dependent. Uh, it depends on where a building is located, what is needing to happen, how hard that building needs to work. A key example given in the CIB report 64 is the example that the same building that is positioned in the Mediterranean climate or in the far north the building in the far north will have to work much harder to provide the same thermal conditions as one that is in a much moderate climate. So we need to talk deeply about what those criteria are and main, mainly those are specific and unique to a specific case. That means that hard work is invested and then we need to look at what the right tool is to actually do that quantification. I've given you four silos or four approaches that you can use. And sometimes it's my observation that in building simulation, we kind of suffer from this saying that to the man with the hammer, every problem looks like a nail and we're just hammering around. But in some cases, you might actually want to switch to one of the other approaches. So that's one thing. We need to find the right, the right hammer or screwdriver to deal with the thing. But then also we might have to configure the tool to the specific analysis needs. And the prototypical image to have there is the wrench, which you adjust to fit the size of the bolt or the nut that you're dealing with. The same goes in my perception for a lot of instrumental approaches, simulation approaches. And even if you do a survey or ask an expert, you need to make sure that the questions you ask are really tailored to what you want to know about that specific building in case. So there's hard work to be done and a full chapter dedicated to this issue in the book. Then there is the energy performance gap. And I already mentioned that in the track record that goes into the book. So I've been looking into this in detail. And interestingly, when I wrote the book, it became more and more obvious to me that we always talk about the energy performance gap, but in fact, there's a whole range of gaps. 
many of them. So if there's 80 performance gaps, uh, 80 performance aspects, then probably you will also have 80 performance gaps that mimic those different domains. So you could have a lighting gap or an acoustic gap or an indoor air quality gap, or for that sake, a vermin intrusion gap, where you say, okay, this might happen, and then you observe what happens in a real situation, and probably it will not be the same. Even worse, each of those gaps that we have is dependent on the time and the context. So your energy prediction during early design will not be the same. Halfway through the design will not be the same from what you get at the end of the design process. And your observation of what you measure uh, straight after hand over to the client will be different from when you're a couple of years in or even worse once you've done a retrofit. So that means there's really a whole range of gaps and we need to be very specific when we talk about what gap we're looking at. On a holistic level, there's a problem there as well. So I talk about those four approaches that we have, the physical measurement, the simulation, the expert judgment, and the stakeholder evaluation. And what you see on the screen is that for some areas, there is reasonable mapping and we can compare things, but in other areas we're missing tools, we are missing approaches, and we cannot even compare. So the example on the top, the green uh, dots, that is a connection on the temperature and energy side, and we do pretty well when we measure temperatures or energy use. We have building simulation tools that can do that job. We have climate consultants that have been trained in this field and can give an opinion, and we actually have a range of surveys that we can bring out to measure thermal comfort and ask people what they make of it. So that is a good area. But let's now jump to the next one. So fire tests. Typically, if you do tests on fire of things, of components, then you will only take a part of the building because you're limited to what you can construct in your lab. So doing fire tests on a whole building level is only possible in simulation. There's very few instances of bringing a full building into the lab. You will have experts that know about these things, but for instance, the stakeholder evaluation might be something about safety perception, but specific on fire, you will not find a lot. Another pet example of mine is burglary protection. So there's clear experiments to do that. That's actually the way things are mostly rated in systems. You put a component like a door or a window in the lab and you bring in a technician and first you ask him to force entry with his bare hands that's your lowest level then you give him a screwdriver that if he manages to get in then you're on a higher level beyond that the power tool and you end up with a crowbar and explosives and you can kind of give him more and more means to get in that is easily done in a lab situation but i've not come across anything that allows us to simulate these things we have safety experts that can look around, so give an give a opinion about how building performs in terms of safety. But again, stakeholder evaluation is one that is, that is almost underdeveloped. So it shows that we have four approaches, but if we look at all the performance aspects that we can study, this mapping is still incomplete and we have holes in our array of tools. So that is quite some deep thoughts about building performance and how we analyze it but then there's this final chapter of the book the emerging theory and i want to spend a few moments to talk about that um, first of all if we talk about theory then that is typically something that is developed over the years based on careful examination again we think about newton sitting under his apple tree an observation is what goes first then people try to explain what happens and then Based on that, we can define principles and pose hypotheses. And in the long run, you might end up with the formulation of laws. I think we are far removed from having the laws of building performance analysis, but my book has a step at trying to establish some facts and observations, to try to make some explanations and to pose some of those principles and hypotheses. So the epilogue actually comes up with 76 observations on on what I counted roughly as 26 topics. 30 comments where I say, well, what I observe, I can have an opinion on why that is and explain that, leading to nine principles and 21 hypotheses. And this is really where I think I would hope that people pick up the book 
and help me to develop this emerging theory of building performance analysis. I'm not going to give everything away. At the end, you should buy the book, but um, here are two examples. So for instance, one of the pet positions that I like to make is that we talk a lot about who is responsible for building performance. And upon reflection, I don't think there is a reason to assign that ownership of building performance to one particular discipline or field. You could have an architect, you could have a consultant, you could have a facility manager. They all have their own reasons to look into this subject. But the key thing here is that we have a champion that actually mentions building performance and makes sure that we, we work on that. An example of an hypothesis has to deal with the 80 performance aspects that I mentioned. Um, I think looking at buildings and looking at my long list that it's very hard to make an overarching taxonomy that is always applicable to every building, which is the general overarching performance approach that you can apply to every single instance. I think what you need to do is look at each individual building, why that building is designed or exists, and then look what aspects are relevant for that specific situation. So I pose the hypothesis that we cannot have an overarching taxonomy or hierarchy that will apply to all buildings in general. And again, this is something that I pose as a hypothesis, and I'll be happy to have discussions about it and people try to prove me wrong. So in the end, there is a book that I'm promoting in this webinar, but I've also started a small website uh, at www.buildingperformance.org in a nod to the building simulation list that has a similar name. This is a place where I will post some of the overview of the book so you can find general content and pointers for instance this webinar was also mentioned there it's also the place where i intend to provide updates and corrections to the books there's also there's going to be errata that point up and things that i find out once i get feedback new developments will be posted there and i hope to really use this as a platform for discussion so if you buy the book and you have feedback please email me contact me through that buildingperformance.org website. And if it's good feedback that I think is relevant to a wider audience, I might ask you to post that on there so it can be discussed by a wider, uh, wider field. Then of course, having written the book, I'm using that in study and research. So here at Plymouth, we run a master of science in high performance buildings that starts off with a module on theory of high performance buildings. And that is a double whammy because it's really based on the theory of the building performance analysis book. That is the textbook for this. And there's also this chapter on high performance buildings that street feeds straight into this masters. Then there's further uh, modules on emerging construction technology, smart and intelligent, the building simulation, but also the financial side and the investment uh, performative architecture in terms of social and cultural dimensions and a research project. So that is really, if you want to work with me and learn about these things, then this is an opportunity. If you're more advanced, then I'm always happy to do bespoke PhD projects. If you have specific interest and that links to building performance analysis, happy to look at opportunities to create bespoke projects on that subject uh, or more generic research, always happy to talk about that. Related to this, I've also done my inaugural lecture again on building performance analysis uh, at the beginning of this month that is online on YouTube. So if after this seminar you want to hear more, you can go online and watch that. Uh, and I've tried to make sure that there's only a minimal overlap between this webinar and what's in that inaugural lecture. So to sum up the building performance analysis book, really tries to give a comprehensive overview of what we know about the subject, uh, the key terms that are in there, definitions, but also the history of how our interest in building performance has developed over the years and the challenges we face. It really tries to look at different stakeholders that have an interest in buildings and their points of view, functional needs, performance requirements, and how you can compare those performance quantification in theory as well as in practice. And it really looks in how we can use this understanding of building performance throughout the building life cycle. 
And like I stressed in this webinar, at the end, it offers this emergent theory for exploration and really invites discussion on this subject. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude this talk and hand back to Rajan to monitor the um, question and answering session at the back of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I have uh, four questions right now in front of me and I'll take one by one. In fact, now we have five, but anyway, let me start. So the first uh, question is from Iki Karjalanin. And uh, the question is, what level of expertise is the book directed at or who gets the most from the material? Peter. Um, my answer to that would be, um, as I positioned in the in the entry to the webinar, it should be at the level that everybody can start on this and chapter one gives a gentle hand in. But given the complexity of the material, I think it's mainly for students in the undergrad in the final years and then master students and PhD students, if you're in the educational side of things. Does Thanks. I think so because I don't know whether Aki will uh, will have a chance to respond. But anyway, let me go on to the second question. The question is: Is computer simulation the best type of evaluation compared to others? This is a question from Pablo. The answer to that is really it depends. Yeah. So the example I gave uh, for a thing like burglary resistance, we don't have any simulation tools, so you can only do that in the lab at the moment. There's other places where building simulation is the only option because there's only a design and you cannot do an experiment. So it really is context dependent. And I think the book really takes a strong position on that and tries to show that that is the case. Thanks. Uh, there's a request. Can you just go back to a slide where uh, YouTube link is been mentioned somebody wants to note that up yeah okay that's it so you can keep oh. that for a while yep. uh, now we go on to another question which is does book just present the general principle of modeling or does it contain specific equations and methods that could be used to create model for example to calculate building energy demand this question is from Jen I would think that if you look for equations, I would refer, and especially if you talk about energy, I would refer to the Orange Book, the first book that is endorsed by IBIPSA. But what this book does, it talks about the deeper underlying approach you need before you can set up an equation. So it talks about what it is, the question you try to answer that goes into setting up a fundamental a physical and mathematical model. But there's no, no deep equations in here. There's too much area to be covered. So, for instance, if you talk about something like CFD, I give a very brief overview about approaches there, about different turbulences. Modules are quickly mentioned, but then there's no space to go into that nitty gritty of formulas. Okay. Uh, the next question is, does this book cover the passive design analysis? Um, that is a difficult question to answer. I, I would think, again, if you're really interested in passive design architecture, there's probably other books that focus on that specifically. This is more about the fundamentals of building performance analysis. And then the design side of things talks about different approaches like integral design or integrated design, that type of thing, without going into the, the specifics of things like passive systems. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, how is your opinion in using BIM models for building performance analysis? Ah, that's an interesting one. Um, I've, I've actually got another hypothesis on that. And um, the quick answer there will be that in my perception, BIM is an excellent tool to capture the geometry of a building and to capture things like the costing or the materials. but if you think at building performance analysis, then what you actually do is you need to do an experiment. You need to excite the building. And you need to observe what happens when you do that excitation. And I think that that is not well covered in BIM. 
So BIM is a nice tool to have, but without deeper thoughts on building performance analysis, we're, we're kind of stuck in a lot of promises that we made in the past that we still cannot answer. Thank you. There are, there are two questions that are they're similar, so I'll, I'll read them together. Uh, first one is, what simulation software do you relate to this book, relate to in the book? And second is, can you list the list in order the top energy modeling programs to use the one you prefer? Oh, um, there's a difference between what I list and what I prefer. And what I actually will do is go into, well, probably takes too long to find the right place. But there's a whole long list of different uh, energy tools in there that um, tries to give an overview um, of the main software you encounter. So things like Energy Plus, Transys, but also in a different back of approaches, the shells that go around those things. So things like Design Builder, IES, also discussed as a separate category. And I think, um, well, you can ask my personal preference on, on the tool, but this book, tra book tries to be neutral and just give an overview of the tools of the trade that are available. At the same time, it's not trying to be an alternative to something like the building energy software tool directory that's maintained by Abipsa USA. That is a good source if you're looking for recommendations for specific tools for specific jobs. Thank you. Uh, does monitoring section refer to building performance evaluation, system evaluation, or diagnostics? Um, the, the section on monitoring or, or measurement talks about physical approaches to, uh, to quantify the performance of a building. Then in the impact section, there is another section on how you operate buildings, and then that has quite a bit on fault detection and diagnosis, things like measurement and verification and monitoring and targeting appear in that size section of the book, so it's in different places. Okay, thanks. And I think this is the last question, uh, which is what is the role of uncertainty in building performance analysis, especially from the perspective of life cycle of a building? A very hard one to answer because it appears at so many places. So there's uncertainty in, in each of your approaches, in each of the fields, um, but it's, it's included in the book at different levels again. So for instance, it appears in the, in the section on design as one of the things we might look at, similar to some concept like optimization, which also comes in different places. But keep in mind that the book is broad and we, we talk about 80 performance aspects, four main approaches to look at each of them. So the question is, it's very hard to answer there. Okay, great. And I think we got one more uh, and I think we have a time of a couple of minutes. So let me ask you. Uh, the question is, as you said, Peter, every analysis talk about performance, but it is rarely defined. How do you suggest to define it through the performance indicator and metrics, or there are other issues that you could suggest? Well, I think what, what, what I like to do is, and I'll go up to the slide on the screen. This one really shows you that there's different dimensions to building performance as a concept, right? So, and I think this is useful because you can make a long list of 80 performance aspects that you could look at, but nobody's going to remember 80 aspects. But you can think if we talk about building performance, we can talk about the building as an object, about the process and that arts dimension. And you can probably remember four or five items that you could ask yourself. So how well, how resource saving, what's the workload capacity, that type of structure, you can have a mental map and ask yourself if you look at the building, whether that's there. So that, that helps us to deal with the subject of building performance. When we then want to quantify it, things become very specific. And there's this specific chapter on that, uh, chapter seven, that actually goes into the mud and puts on the boots to discuss those issues how you need to tailor it to a specific situation. And then I think there is no generic answer. And again, it's very context dependent. Thank you very much. I think uh, I was about to say this is the last question, but very interesting question came up. Uh, 
and let me let me read that out can you trust the results of optimization modeling with their own el algorithms in recent many web based modeling tools that goes in in for me into the same situation as uh, the uncertainty analysis in some some sense that is a, a subject that optimization you can apply to every performance aspect to every tool you have and to try to find the best variant the key underlying thing where the book really tries to make a contribution is to ask yourself well what is it that we're looking at what is the stakeholder need the client need how do we analyze that and then once we know that you can ask yourself whether optimization has, has a role to play but if you don't ask the right question, then we're at the limited pass, at the limited span, maybe constrained search space that you're looking at. So then things might become dangerous. Thank you. There are a couple of questions regarding lead and Briam. Probably I will I will uh, skip them. And the last question was about recommendation of any online courses. So I would suggest, Ahmed, that you can look at the Ibipsa YouTube channel. Uh, there are 16, 18, uh, sessions conducted, recorded, available free of uh, uh, free of charge, and there are Ibipsa USA also has a few online uh, webinars which could be which could be of your help to even get start 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 understanding about building performance and building performance analysis. So uh, we don't have any more questions now, Peter. Uh, Thank you very much for offering this. And I'm sure that this book is going to be a textbook in many, many places. And we'll keep referring to your uh, websites as well. I'm sure that some new discussion will take place in, on, on the web platform which you have established. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. With this, I'll end the webinar. The recording of this would be available early next week on uh, Ibipsa University channel of YouTube. Thank you for joining.